Thank you so much for joining us as we take you around San Diego. I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. Sincerely hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Well, I'll now get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. We do begin with a new program that's hoping to fight homelessness by connecting people on the street with loved ones. The program is in the testing stages, focusing on people experiencing homelessness in East County. CBS 8's Esmeralda Perez explains how it would reunite them with family in other parts of San Diego and beyond. A pilot program for cities in the East County is in the works to help people facing homelessness get reunited with their loved ones. It's a crisis affecting San Diego County, people living on the streets without a home. Ending homelessness begins first with a home. And to really, you have to get to know them. You have to hear their story. Roland Slade is a homeless advocate involved in the East County Homeless Task Force. He's seen firsthand the need for housing. We have the second highest population of folks living in homelessness. Most of them, 85% of them, have grown up here in this community. With many people living on the streets, county leaders are making efforts to find them a place to live. I think the, the big thing to remember is what we've been doing is not working. So we've got to try new things. We've got to think outside the box and we got to be willing to try it all. County supervisors received funding and approval for the family reunification pilot program this year. And after one year of working in East County, supervisors will decide if they should expand the program or change paths. Right now, it focuses on homeless people in El Cajon, La Mesa, Lemon Grove, and Santee. The goal is to relocate homeless people and connect them with family members. Usually it's a bus ride. Um, uh, sometimes it could be as simple as a car ride. You know, you may be in South Bay and you have family members in North County and you have no way of getting there, but we help you close that gap. Whether it's in North County or anywhere in the country, this new program will reunite them. The families must first be willing to take them in before they get sent away. Those part of the program may also receive services like housing navigation, case management, and supportive services. The success is not sheer numbers, but it's really about lives. So if we're able to save one life off the streets of San Diego and see a family restored, you know, whatever the connection was and how they got disconnected, we're able to mend that. It's, it's worth the effort. The program is open to anyone experiencing homelessness in East County. For more information on the application process, visit the online version of this story at CBS8.com. Esmeralda Perez, CBS8. Esme, thank you. Well, community activists are now calling for an outside agency to investigate allegations of misconduct and corruption within the San Diego Police Department. Current SDPD Captain Alberto Leos came forward last month to say he's been harassed, discriminated against, and bullied within the department and by Police Chief David Nislight. Activist Tasha Williamson has now filed complaints with the California Department of Justice against both the department and the chief. She joined other activists activists downtown to call for an investigation. I think that we've seen enough, we have heard enough, and we cannot continue to ask for community members to continue to put their trust in folks that don't deserve it. Yeah, the San Diego Police Officers Association responded to Williamson's complaint with a statement. It reads in part, based on past allegations, her claims are not credible and the SDPOA will be reviewing this for libel and legal action. Meantime, two men are in jail accused of shooting up a house party in El Cajon last month and killing two teens. The two suspects have been identified as 24 year old Dan Nalab and 21 year old Bruce Liu. They are facing first degree murder charges and are being held without bail. The shooting happened on October 28th at a short term vacation rental home on Mahogany Drive. A 16 year old and an 18 year old were both shot and killed. When police arrived on the scene, they didn't find any suspects Specs, but investigators say automated license plate reader technology led them to the getaway vehicle and those arrests. Well, a church in San Diego has opened its doors and is taking in migrants. CBS 8's Jasmine Ramirez visited Our Lady of Guadalupe in Logan Heights for a Thanksgiving dinner held for the migrants being sheltered there. Our Lady Guadalupe never planned to start a shelter, but in the fall they began finding migrants sleeping outside on their steps. It was then they decided to help. I'm all about making people feel loved because at the end of the day we're all human and so that makes me really happy. 
Tonight, Our Lady Guadalupe spread holiday cheer by sharing an American tradition, Thanksgiving dinner. We decided to bring our uh, migrant brothers and sisters some food so that they can have some of that Thanksgiving you know, holiday spirit that they don't get to experience at, in their home countries. It's something that I feel very passionate about to be able to give back to the community. The church is sheltering more than 30 men in their community building. It was converted into a shelter space with blow up mattresses two months ago. Different groups of churchgoers have volunteered to cook dinners each night. We felt like the spirit was calling us to do this. We've been asking what does it mean to be a, a Jesuit parish, a Catholic parish here so close to the border. And I think this was kind of a way that God answered the prayers. Pastor Scott Santa Rosa says from the start, parishioners have opened their hearts and their homes to migrants in need. He is hopeful more people in the community will follow. It feels like a lot of people are saying this is the right thing. We're glad you're doing it. I wish more people would say it's the right thing and we're going to do it like at our own churches. I would encourage any other churches in the San Diego area to consider taking in migrant families. The church has no plans to stop what they're doing for the migrants. If you're interested in helping, you can find more information by clicking the online version of this story at CBS8.com. Jasmine Ramirez, CBS8. Jasmine, thank you. Well, a San Diego senior who has been scammed twice now says, says that she wants to help others avoid becoming a target. The San Diego District Attorney says that, of course, anyone can fall victim, but senior citizens are losing more because they have more to lose. CBS 8's Abby Black is working for you. She talked to the woman and has tips on how to protect yourself. Pat Holden thought that she was getting an email from Amazon where she could get three months Prime membership for free. It was during the holidays, so she thought that would be fantastic. Moments later, she realized it was a scam. We're working for you on how tech scams are taking advantage of online shoppers. I actually don't shop stores hardly ever. 76-year-old Pat Holden hopes by sharing how she fell for this Amazon membership scam, she'll prevent it from happening to others. I gotta tell you, I'm pretty good at checking everything. The Fletcher Hills online shopper thought that the email was from Amazon offering free Prime membership since it said that her membership expired. Extend for free. Right Holden there. says that she clicked the link. This was one of the things that I filled out to get given my credit card. Holden shared with us that her husband just fell for a Facebook scam and she had to get a new credit card. So she thought her payment information needed to be updated with Amazon. I waited. I waited. That's when Holden called Amazon and was told oh, it was a scam. She then called her bank and froze her account. Within nine minutes, I took care of it. It hasn't always been easy for Holden. This isn't the first time I've been had, believe me. That's why I can't believe I fell for this one. I found that every single day, elderly San Diegans are falling for these scams on the phone, text, and email. And for 2023, we're already over $75 million in losses due to elder scams alone. San Diego County Deputy District Attorney Scott Perillo heads the Elder Abuse Unit and helped create the first of its kind Elder Justice Task Force. It's made up of local law enforcement and the FBI. He applauds Holden for coming forward. That there's nothing to be ashamed of. They need to report it so that we know how large the problem is here locally. Perillo says that they also provide support for victims. He recommends before you do anything, take a pause and slow down, hang up the phone, call someone you love. Perillo recommends that victims report scams to the FBI at IC3.gov and also report it to local law enforcement. I don't think if I would have just walked away, it wouldn't have been so easy for me. Looking back, Holden wishes that she had taken a breath and seen the red flag in the email address. Daintyho.com. The grandmother's glad that she didn't lose any money and hopes her story prevents others from getting scammed. I'm very, very careful. Just not that time. Everything fell into place just so that I could get scammed. Working for you, Abby Black, CBS 8. Oh, yes, please don't, don't fall victim, truly. Well, the San Diego Sheriff's Department has two new crime fighting and firefighting tools at its disposal. They unveiled their new helicopters this week. One will help deputies on the ground during emergency calls, tracking suspects and aiding in search and rescue operations. The other will have a 375 gallon tank that can drop water or foam during wildfires. This is the first step in phasing out the current fleet of fire helicopters built back in the 1960s. 
Well, cold case detectives have identified a murder victim more than 50 years after her body was found in a suitcase floating in the San Diego Bay. As CBS 8's David Godfordson reports in a True Crime Files report, investigators are hoping that the name and photo of the victim will lead to her killer. Shortly before noon today, uh, a couple of fishermen uh, here in the Embarcadero uh, came down to check their boat, found a uh, large suitcase under the pier. The two fishermen who found the woman's body can be seen standing on the dock near the U.S. Coast Guard station on San Diego Bay. This is CBS 8 archive film footage of the crime scene from June 13, 1973. Uh, they opened it up partially and uh, saw what appeared to be uh, uh, human parts in the suitcase. Inside an orange suitcase, police found a dismembered torso and arms. The hands reportedly tied together with nylon cord. The body also had visible stab wounds. A uh, search in the immediate area uh, disclosed uh, two human legs. Search by whom? Uh, by harbor police divers who were called to the scene. The woman's head and legs found in trash bags floating nearby in the bay. Four months after the body was found, CBS 8 did a reenactment of the 1973 crime scene in an effort to get witnesses to come forward. Despite those efforts and a lengthy investigation by police, the victim remained unidentified for the past 50 years. In 1973, DNA was not used in forensics and was not used in law enforcement. But in 2020, San Diego Police cold case detective Lori Adams took another look at the case. When I recognized that this case was unsolved, I contacted the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office and spoke with them about the possibility of exhuming her so we can get DNA. Detective Adams turned over the remains to Othram, a cold case DNA lab in Texas that specializes in using genetic genealogy to identify relatives of the deceased. We were able to trace back um, a distant relative um, that was from uh, New Jersey. David Middleman is CEO of Othram. He says the murder victim's relative that they found was a fourth to sixth cousin. So this person would have done consumer testing at one point or another, had uploaded their data to one of these databases, and had selected the consent option for using, uh, using their profile in a, a law enforcement search. Through interviews with the relatives, Detective Adams identified the victim, 29-year-old Arminda Ribeiro, last seen alive by her two young daughters in Newark, New Jersey, one month before her body was found in San Diego Bay. We're trying to understand why and how she arrived in San Diego. The family and the friends that we have spoken to in Newark, New Jersey, tell us that she has no connection to California and no connection to San Diego. Police learned Ribeiro immigrated to New Jersey from Portugal in 1968. She only spoke Portuguese and she had worked in New Jersey at a tractor trailer business. The Portuguese community in San Diego was robust back in uh, the 70s and 80s, and that area is the Point Loma area, which is very close to where the Coast Guard Station is now and the uh, Embarcadero. Now 50 years is a long time, but the killer still has not been identified. If you remember Ribeiro or you recognize her photo or you know anything about her, contact the San Diego Police Department. On the Embarcadero, David Goffertson, CBS 8. Well, I hope that family can get some closure and justice. David, thank you. Well, we are learning Lemon Grove is considering new regulations to shut down illicit massage parlors. These illegal businesses are often hiding in plain sight. These new regulations would cap the number of massage businesses at eight. They would have to be at at least a thousand feet apart from each other as well. Owners would also be required to pass background checks. Windows into these businesses also cannot be blacked out and hours would be limited from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. This is an effort to make sure that everybody's safe, everybody's, we promote our businesses, but at the same time have safety as a priority. Yeah, so five other cities in San Diego County have already passed similar regulations. Lemon Grove City Council is expected to take a final vote on this new ordinance December 5th. 
Well, a substitute teacher with the Vista Unified School District is facing several charges after police say a mother found him with her 13 year old daughter. Police arrested 27 year old Connor Chanove after the girl's mother says that she found them engaging in inappropriate activity in his car. Police say it happened at um, the regional park in Oceanside on Saturday. Vista Unified released a statement saying, quote, we are appalled by the thought that someone trusted to work with our children would betray their trust and innocence. Please be assured that this adult will not be on any campus in the district and that our administrative team will cooperate fully with law enforcement to ensure that justice is served, end quote. Genove will be in court on Monday. Well, the San Diego Humane Society is dealing with two highly contagious diseases that have now killed at least four dogs. They tell us extreme overcrowding is the main culprit. Right now, they have more than 400 dogs and puppies in their care and say they simply do not have enough room to isolate the animals. Instead, they are treating every dog with antibiotics to prevent the illness from spreading. The shelter says that what they really need right now is for more San Diegans to step up and adopt or foster a dog. We've never had this many dogs in care and now on top of this we're dealing with a disease. So if there is any way you could bring home a dog for two weeks, it would be a huge help and create some space in our shelter here. Yeah, the Humane Society is waiving all adoption fees until December 1st. And don't worry, if you were to adopt today, they tell us that any other pets that you have at home will not be at risk because of the antibiotic treatments. Well, the transgender pride flag was flying at half staff this week at the San Diego LGBT Community Center for Trans Day of Remembrance. Dozens gathered to remember the 45 transgender and non-binary lives lost to hate-based violence around the U.S. this year. There was a vigil for those victims and speeches from transgender community members. The center says it's a time for mourning, but also for celebrating the community. It's a space for us to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of community, chosen family, for the entire LGBTQ community to show support for our transgender and non-binary siblings. If you are looking for more information on other events, go to the thecentersd.org. Well, if you are thinking about buying an electric vehicle, should you buy now or wait until next year? There are some tax changes to consider. CBS 8 Shannon Handy is working for you to get details straight from the experts. Most electric vehicles qualify for a federal tax credit. That credit will still be available in 2024, but depending on the car you choose, it could be reduced. As electric vehicles continue to evolve, so too are the tax incentives that come along with them. If you look up Tesla's Model 3 on its homepage, you may notice this message stating the $7,500 federal tax credit could be reduced by half in 2024. We wanted to know why. The tax incentive for alternative fuel vehicles is always shifting and moving around. Carl Brower is an executive analyst at IC Cars, an online automotive search engine and research website. He explained the Inflation Reduction Act, which Congress passed in August of 2022, limited credits to cars with battery components and raw materials that come from the U.S. or a free trade partner. Those restrictions get stricter each year, and Tesla believes it may not qualify for half of the $7,500 credit with next year's tightening of restrictions. They want the battery production in the U.S., so a certain amount of cars fell out of the $7,500 federal tax incentive. Because of this, you may see some companies, including Tesla, slash prices to make up for those lost incentives. Chris George, general manager of Team Kia of El Cajon, says because Kias don't qualify, they found other ways to pass along $7,500 in savings to customers. So when you lease a vehicle, say from an import, they wind up matching that. George says he's confident those incentives aren't going away anytime soon, so there's no rush to buy now versus later. But there is another change coming in 2024 that could sway you to wait. Starting next year, that $7,500 tax incentive will be offered right away via the dealership as opposed to months later when filing taxes. So you fall in an adjusted gross income of fifty dollars or $60,000. You may not be able to use the full tax credit because you don't have a big enough tax liability. So this is really a benefit for the consumers into 2024. Instead of paying fewer taxes 
when you file your return, you'll pay less for the car when you buy it. Both experts say do your research to ensure your income bracket qualifies for a rebate. Another thing to consider, California, which offers additional rebates for electric vehicles, is no longer accepting new applications. Instead, in 2024, they plan to provide subsidies only to low to middle income residents who have more trouble affording electric cars. Working for you, I'm Shanna Handy for CBS 8. But I don't think it's fair to the community to take an action that affects the community. And again, this is considered sacred ground, and those were memorial benches. Right in front of me. Yeah, so right now, visitors and people who live near Swami's Beach in Encinitas are confused about why all of the cliffside benches there have been removed. Neighbors say the benches were placed by families as memorials throughout the years. We did reach out to the city of Encinitas that they indicated that the benches were temporarily removed for maintenance. In a statement, the city said, quote, the cherished memorials on some of the benches are always carefully protected and left undisturbed while being cleaned or maintained. We express our gratitude to the community for their understanding and patience as we diligently work to maintain these benches, ensuring they continue to be cherished elements of our community landscape for years to come. So yes, they will be coming back, but just not quite sure exactly though when that will be. Well, an upcoming movie will focus on a woman who has been the subject of conspiracy theories and controversy after she was shot and killed during the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And as CBS 8's Ariana Cohen reports, some parts of the movie on Ashley Babbitt will be filmed here in San Diego. The shooting death of Ashley Babbitt at the Capitol on January 6, 2021, will now be the central focus of an upcoming biopic. On that day, a mob rushed the Capitol to protest the results of the 2020 presidential election. As seen in this video, 35-year-old Babbitt attempted to climb through a broken window towards the House chamber before she was shot by a Capitol police officer. The film is created by SMS Novel, a faith-based interactive film company that has produced biopics like I Am Kim Porter and King of Detroit. Paints a pretty clear picture of, number one, the American journey, because all of us kind of can find ourselves in Ashley Babbitt in some ways. But secondly, somewhat of a cautionary tale that misinformation has some deadly consequences. I spoke with the film's director, Jomo Johnson. We're not promoting one view or the other. Again, I think the, the fact that she's no longer with us uh, shows that there is a consequence of whatever side you choose. It is titled Nero's Martyr, named after the Roman emperor. Nero, a Roman emperor who uh, was very unique at using the skill of propaganda to persuade his countrymen and his enemies. While he says exact filming locations have to remain private due to safety concerns, filming will take place in Ocean Beach, where she most recently lived, Spring Valley, where she worked for her family pool business, and Washington, D.C. Because most of what happened was in D.C., uh, but we do plan on doing the biographical portion with the main actress that's playing the character in uh, West San Diego. The film will be released on January 6th, 2024. It will be available for sale and streaming. I don't think she was going there to die that day. I don't think her plan was not to come home. I think she thought she was going to be part of a protest. I don't think she knew what was going to happen, uh, but I don't think she planned to die. I don't think she was willing or wanting to die. I don't think she thought she was going to die. And so I think we have to discover that if something like that can happen to someone who just is taking part of a protest, can it happen to us? No video previews are available just yet. More information is posted on CBS8.com. Ariana Cohen, CBS8. Ariana, thank you. Well, changes are underway at San Diego Pride following the unexpected resignation of its executive director. The organization confirmed Fernando Lopez Jr. resigned on Monday. No other details were given, but the board of directors says they will oversee the organization while they search for a new leader. Lopez posted a statement online which read in part, quote, I am so eternally grateful to have had the privilege of serving San Diego Pride's mission for nearly 13 years. I couldn't be more proud of all we've accomplished together, end quote. 
Now, although around for more than a century, milk banks are not always on new parents need to know list, but they can be a life saving option for premature babies in need. Jesse Pagan went inside the University of California Health Milk Bank, serving hospitals across the state from here in San Diego. It's really special inside the San Diego blood bank building near Mount Hope. It's something that can't be, you know, reproduced. Something else is also saving lives. Welcome to the milk laboratory. This is the lab inside the University of California Health Milk Bank. We have uh, milk techs working here, uh, Nguyen, Eric and Micah, and they all are um, are people who have a specialty in nutrition and they all work in the NICU in our hospital. Dr. Lisa Stellwagen is the medical director. I worked in the community clinic, I worked in private practice, but I found my dream job when I started working in the newborn medical unit at UC San Diego. She worked closely with new moms in the hospital's breastfeeding program. That's when her team discovered something in some of the most fragile babies. We started reducing the rate of necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a bowel catastrophe that can happen to the tiniest babies, um, especially if they're not receiving their mother's own milk. That sparked the idea of a milk bank to help babies and moms who can't produce their own. It stayed an idea until a philanthropic family gave a multi-million dollar gift. In 2020, the milk bank opened. But our goal is to become like the standard. They're well on their way. Dr. Stellwagen sits on the Human Milk Banking Association of North America Board of Directors and played a part in creating stringent health protocols, all starting with donors like Andy Arnold. I have three kids, and with my third, I was overproducing milk. I didn't know what to do with it. Until a friend told her about the milk bank. After a stringent vetting process, she got the green light and started donating. No idea that something like this existed. And so once I found out about it, I knew that I was meant to help other babies and just kind of provide a sense of support to other moms. She even found out the nutrition facts of her breast milk. This freezer is the first stop for all donations waiting for inspection. But you can see the, the orderliness of it, the way the mothers have categorized it. There's so much love that goes into this. From here, techs take it to the lab. They'll grab a sample to run a culture and make sure there's no bacteria or viruses pasteurization won't kill. Then techs will carefully mix it with other donations tweaking the nutritional contents along the way. Hex now bottle it, pasteurize it, and take another sample for testing. This milk is all pasteurized um, and just waiting, awaiting the culture. Once the test comes back clear, the bottles go straight to NICUs to save lives. I'm forever thankful for the families that take the time and the effort. But, you know, that's, that's what people do for each other. Yeah, so that was our Jesse Pagan there reporting in the milk bank, of course, tries not to waste any milk. They sell the batches not up to perfect nutrition standards for the NICU to families who choose to not use formula or to families who don't have access to their own milk, like LGBTQ families or those doing surrogacy. To find out more, go to CBS8.com. Well, volunteers are making the holidays a whole lot brighter for local veterans in need. The Hello Auto Group, an automotive dealership company, gave away Thanksgiving meals. The first delivery was at the Veterans Village of San Diego. Volunteers then headed over to the Vets Villa in Escondido and handed out turkeys and hams to vets there. In total, 152 Thanksgiving meal boxes were given out to veterans in need. Hello is just, you know, really grateful that we're able to do this and that we have, you know, the platform to do it and the capabilities to do it. Um, and we're just so happy to be able to, you know, give back to the people that serve us and, you know, those who need it. So thankful as well. So they are heading to Santa Clarita next. And yeah, it is the season to give back. Well, the San Diego Padres have a new manager. Mike Schilt signed a two year contract. He was actually fired by the Cardinals two years ago after leading St. Louis to three straight playoff appearances. He's been with the Padres organization now for almost two years and replaces Bob Melvin, who left um, for the San Francisco Giants last month. And Padres players are swinging into action by also giving away 1,000 free turkeys along with traditional fixings for local families in need, of course, for Thanksgiving. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen stopped by Petco Park. Here's what she found. Current and former Padres players and volunteers are making Thanksgiving a little greater for 1,000 local families. We got it. 
Uh, it feels great. It feels good, you know, more food, uh, new year, more food on the table. More food will be on the table for many families in need this Thanksgiving. Bless. Thank you so much for everything. And thank you for organizing. Families are driving away with turkey and all the Thanksgiving fixings thanks to the Padres and Northgate Market. We do it for different organizations throughout the halt throughout the year. And this year we're giving it, uh, providing food for USO families, uh, Armed Services Y. MCA families as well as families that are uh, recommended from the food bank. There's families that really need the help. This is an honor that uh, all these volunteers are out here uh, taking time out of their day to, to do something good for us. Let's go right up there for your turkey. Familiar faces are handing out the turkeys. The swinging fryer, Padres pitcher Tom Cosgrove. You get pretty low. <laughs> Plus, former Padres players Mark Grant and Brian Lawrence are all volunteering today. I told my mom I was giving out some turkeys today, so she was excited and happy that I was doing something good in the community. Being a part of not only the Padres and, and helping them out, but coming down and helping the community as well is a, is a great feeling. Uh, a lot of smiles, a lot of happy Thanksgivings, uh, happy holidays. Something as small as a meal means a great deal to these local families in need. Like one box at a time, I think it might be easier. It's very nice, very nice. I have a great Thanksgiving now. Thank you. It's very hard for us, me and my husband, we're both working full time. It's hard for us to make any food distributions. Living in California is just very hard for us. Wow. So this will make it better, won't it? A hundred percent. Oh, I'm just so happy and blessed that I can have this for my family. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. Giving to you. Likewise. Really good stuff. So happy to share positive news with you as well. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for staying informed. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take such good care.